Right, so I'm Mike Brown, so this is a bit of a Brown show. Uh, and as Simon says, I um, started ETFs here 20 years ago, and I'm still doing ETFs. So I haven't progressed much. <laughs> but hopefully I know a bit about ETFs. Uh, um, everybody knows a little bit about something. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is ETFs. Um, the issue I want to cover is, uh, is, is basically using ETFs in... Uh, in structuring and setting up portfolios. I think a lot of us use single ETFs. We like buying Satrix 40 or we buy a world ETF. But how do you structure portfolios or how do you structure a diversified approach to markets using ETFs? So that's really what, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to start, though, with a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a primer. And there is an agenda, so you'll see if I wander around as I normally do. But there's sort of you're going to try and do various things. On, uh, on the agenda, what are ETFs, they index trackers, what's an index, let's talk a bit about indices, uh, how do you construct portfolios using strategic asset allocation models and uh, multi-asset index portfolios, etc., etc. I want to just talk very briefly about tax-free investments in retirement funds. The critical issue I want to talk about is default options, which is a new thing in retirement funds, but we, uh, we can go a bit beyond that. Then we'll just finish with managed ETF portfolios at the end. Now, I'm going to be quite quick so we can do questions and, uh, and have a bit of interrelationship with the audience. So if you really feel that you want to ask a question while I'm carrying on, you can do that. But let's try and leave it to the end. Um, but it's up to you. So this is quite informal. All right, so uh, what are ETFs? Well, they're shares. They list on the JSC as normal shares. So they trade on the JSC. And there's now 106 ETFs on the JSC, as, as Simon said. And there's only about 350-odd shares on the JSC. So as the shares contract, the ETFs go up. So at least uh, they're going in the right direction. Um, and they trade just like a normal share. But where the difference between an ETF and a normal share is that if you buy an exchange-traded fund, you're getting a portfolio of shares. So when you go and buy a share on the JSC, and you can buy any share, you can buy ABSA, Anglo-American, African Rainbow, We just that's just the A's. You're buying the performance and the financial results of a single company. When you're buying an ETF, you're buying a fund, you're buying a portfolio. So you're buying a whole bunch of shares. And that's why they call them exchange traded. They trade on exchanges, and they're a fund or they're a portfolio. Now, that portfolio effectively is an index. And an index is a, uh, is a way you measure the performance of a market. So an index, let's say the top 40 index is the top 40 shares in the JSC, or the S&P 500 is the top 500 shares in the US, or you can do a world index, which is the top 1,600 companies in the world. An ETF just tracks an index. It actually goes out, and it gives you the performance of that entire index. So, they, uh, so the key issue to remember with ETFs, they're index trackers, and index trackers are passive. <laughs> okay, so passive investment is tracking an index. Active investment is where you've got some smart alec who says you can beat the market, and uh, we'll talk a bit about that as we go along. But active investors try to outperform an index. Index trackers say we'll deliver you the performance of that index. So ETFs are index trackers. They're listed on exchanges, and they're portfolios rather than a single company exposure. Um, what's an index? That's the top 40 index on the JSC. And it's alphabetical. Um, it's a... Uh, and you're saying, well, there's not 40 shares there, so there's a second page, so there are 40 shares, so it goes down all the way down to Vodacom and Woolworths, and there's a first page as well. So that's the top 40 shares on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. 90% of all the trades, value and volumes in the JSC happen in those top 40 shares. And they measure that index every 15 seconds. So there's 40 shares there, and they measure 10 of the share prices go up, 5 of them fall, and the other 30 odds don't do anything. They measure the returns or the prices of those 40 shares. And there's actually 41 shares in there, if some of you are counting. Um, they measure the returns of those every 15 seconds. So an index is a live thing. It's moving all the time because the share prices of those companies are, are changing all the time. So that's your top 40 index. Sorry, yeah, nice per huh? second, nice second, second page. Yes, yeah, so there we go. <laughs> okay. Now, that gentleman has raised a very good question because he says, well, what's 24 next to NASPERS? So that's your market cap weighting. So what you do when you measure an index, you say some shares trade more than others, and some companies are bigger than others, and some companies have a, a freer float. In other words, there's more shares available to invest in. 
And so when you look at those things together, you find that nice purse is much more important in making up the price of the market than, say, Woolworths. I mean, Woolworths just sells food and ladies' underwear and stuff like that. It's not particularly important, whereas nice purse is, you know, owns 30%, 35% of Tencent, which is the biggest uh, IT company in China. Now, that 24%, 24,24% is quite important. Because when you're tracking an index and you say, I've got 100 Rand to spend to invest in the index, you'll put 24 Rand, 24 cents into nice purse. And you'll put 87 cents into Woolworths. Because that's your market weighting. So the critical thing to remember about an index tracker, the index tracker manager will go out and buy that portfolio. So it doesn't, whatever money he's got, whether it's hundreds of millions or billions, he'll go and buy that exact portfolio in that exact ratio. 24% of all his money will go to nice purse, and 0.87% will go to Woolworths, and 1.13% will go into Vodacom. So his portfolio exactly reflects the index. So what happens is that index goes up and down every 15 seconds, so does the value of the index tracking portfolio. And an index tracking portfolio, whoever runs a tracker fund, whether it's Satrix 40 or it's a Ashburton Top 40 or it's a Core Shares S&P 500, they exactly replicate that index. Whether it's a South African index or global index, they own the underlying shares that make up that index. That's what an index tracker is. Now, 24%... Of the, of the total amount of money you invest will go to Nosbit because it's it's bigger, it has a bigger market cap, it trades more than Woolworths. Yeah, so it's market cap related and it's also related to how much it trades and free floats and stuff like that. So uh, there is quite a bit of methodology behind that, but that's that's effectively your weighting. Now your index tracking manager will exactly replicate an index, so he won't go out and pick, should I buy Nosbit or should I buy Sassel? He'll go and just buy that, that portfolio. So he's what's called a passive manager. He'll go and replicate that portfolio, and he'll give you effectively the return of the market because an index measures all the trades in the market, so the average return in the market is contained in an index, particularly if that index in South Africa, the top 40 index, makes up 90% of the trades. So an ETF gives you exposure to an index. It does it by replicating the index, and it's a... Uh, and it does it quite efficiently, and uh, that's all they do. Now, are they worthwhile? Well, if you buy, let's say, a S and P 500, Standard Poor's 500, you buy one share. Now you own the top 500 shares in America. <laughs> you own a little bit of the top 500 shares in America. You own, if you buy one Citrix 40, 24 percent of your money is sitting in Nice Purse, and less than one rand sitting in Woolworths. But you own a bit of all of them. So you're buying, it's like buying a box of chocolates, you open it up, there's 40 different chocolates in there, and, the, and they're all yours. You don't have to share them with a the wife or the kids. It's, uh, you're buying a diversified portfolio by buying an index. And, uh, and diversification has all sorts of factors that, uh, that help it uh, manage risk, reduce volatility. ETFs uh, or indices typically only cover the blue chip stocks. As I said, there's 350 shares in the JSC, but they only really measure the returns of the top 40 companies because the rest of them don't matter all that much, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, you're buying blue chips. You're buying the best shares in the market. So it's always a high-quality investment. So you won't find Tongart. You won't find EOH and those sort of companies in an index. Steinhoff was in the index, but it disappeared in one day. <laughs> it fell out the index. It had 2% weighting in the index. The index fell the day Steinhoff dropped down to two rands a share. By the next day, the index had gone up. It already compensated for Steinhoff no longer being in the index. So everybody is saying, well, Discovery's share price has gone down 20% this week. Well, Discovery is only 0.6% of the index. It really doesn't make a big difference. It's the top 40 index, what happens to the price of Discovery. Whereas if you own Discovery shares, you're 20% poorer <laughs> this week. If you own the index... What's happened to discovery is, has a marginal impact on the index. So index investing does give you a certain amount of protection because of that diversification. But the critical thing with buying an index <clears throat> is this gentleman now owns 41 shares, but he's only bought one share. So he's only had to pay brokerage once, and he's only had to pay that ripple fees the JSC charges you 16 rand to trade once. If he'd bought all 41 shares, he'd have to pay that 41 times. <coughs> so it's a bargain. 
you're getting exposure to the market simply through buying a single security and you're getting it cheaply and you're getting diversification and all those sort of aspects that you really look for in an investment portfolio. So indices are, are basically worthwhile and they're transparent. You know what's in an index. So it's not a case of not knowing what's in your portfolio. And that's quite important because an active manager won't tell you what's in his portfolio. I'm not going to pick on anybody, but your Alan Gray is not going to say what's in my portfolio because then Coronation knows what he's doing. <laughs> well, or mutual. So, so if you say what's in the portfolio, they'll give you a fact sheet, which was you know, last quarter's portfolio. They won't tell you what it is today. But the index, you know, every day they publish on the JSC website what's in an index. So you know exactly which companies you own and what the weightings are. So it's very transparent. And that's why you're able to trade ETFs if you're a trader, you know, a day trader or a hedge fund, all the rest, because you know exactly what's in the portfolio. <laughs> Whereas if I go and buy a unit trust from somebody, I'm not quite sure what's in there. And the guy's woken up this morning and decides he's going to sell all his uh, NASPERS. And you're buying this thing because you like this fund because it's got NASPERS in, but in fact, it hasn't got any NASPERS in anymore. And you only find that out at the end of the quarter when he publishes his fact sheet. In fact, you find that out four or five months later. So the transparency in ETFs is the main reason why they trade so much. And often in America, where ETFs are bigger than here, 50% or so of all the trades in the American stock market are in ETFs because all the participants know what's in the ETFs. So that's what they'll trade, even if they're doing pairs trading or single day trading or edge trading or whatever have you. So that's, um, that's a bit about indices and ETFs. Now, through ETFs, you can buy all types of exposure. You can buy South African equities, top 40 Say uh, the sector index, you buy industrial index, you buy a financial index, you can buy a capped index, capped top 50. You can buy global shares. You want to invest in China, there's a China ETN on the JSC. There's quite a few American S&P 500s. You can buy a European stock market exposure. You can buy the FTSE 100 if you think Boris Johnson's going to get it right, you know, whatever have you. Um, and he might, you never know. But, but you can get exposure to, to the UK market if you want by buying a single ETF. So you get it. Exposure to foreign shares, local shares, listed property. Nobody wants to look at a listed property share at the moment, which means it's probably the right time to buy it. So, uh, but you know, you can buy an ETF. You don't have to go and pick a single listed property share. You can go and buy a portfolio of listed property shares. And that gives you that diversification. It gives you the reduction of exposure, the concentration issues and so on that you have if you buy a single property stock. And by the way, listed property gives you a 9% dividend yield which is not bad. You know, when you get that sort of high yield, that's normally the right time to buy listed property. But we're not going to give any tips. Bonds, you can buy bonds as well. <coughs> uh, South African bonds, global bonds. There's quite a few global bond funds now in the JSC. You can buy commodities. And we all wish we bought rhodium three years ago because it's gone up 80% per annum each and every one of the last three years. Everybody says, what's rhodium? Well, it's gone up 80% in the last three years, so you'll find out. Because, yeah. It's done that so well, you find out what it is. But you can buy gold, or if you really want to, you can buy copper or corn or wheat or oil or whatever have, have you. Those ETFs are all available on the JSC. It gives you exposure to commodities. Commodities are very interesting at the moment <laughs> because other markets are running out of steam. And guess what's happening? People are looking at alternative investments, and the price of gold has gone from, what, $1,200 to $1,500? Alternative investment. <laughs> so commodities have their periods when they look quite interesting. Or you can buy all sorts of clever ETFs, which they call smart beta or factor investing. So you've got all these different ETFs that you can invest in. So why buy one? <laughs> now, what we've heard from Warren Buffett and people like is Warren Buffett, who's the world's best known investor, he says, well, just put all your money in the S&P 500. But now there's 6,000 ETFs in the world. Why would you just buy one? What about the other 5,999 ETFs? They must have something going for them. So why would you just buy one where you can get exposure to all these different sorts of asset classes and all these different types of market uh, uh, exposures? So the, the breadth of the ETF market, as I say, there's 106 of them in South Africa. There's over 6,000 ETFs listed on global stock exchanges is what you now need to look. But the critical thing, and I won't rub this in too much, because you might have people, you know, your husband might work there or your son or something like that. But how well do active managers, these are guys who go out there and say, well, we can outperform the index, and that's their mandate, to do better than the benchmark. The benchmark is the index. How many active managers outperform an index? And this is what we call the 
the SPIVA survey, which is done by S&P. And in South Africa, for the last one year, three years, and five years, 93% of all the unit trust funds in South Africa have underperformed the representative index. So if you want to go and find a unit trust manager that's doing well, you've got to go and pick the 6%, 6% that can outperform the index. No, that's okay. Maybe you're a genius. You can find that 6% that are doing it. Otherwise, just go and buy the index. And you're going to beat 93% of the guys out there. Nothing against those blokes. I mean, they're all nice. They all live in Cape Town, they. <laughs> Wear shorts to work and sunglasses and shoes without socks and so on. They're casual blokes. They're nice blokes in the way. But they, they're getting overpaid if they can't beat an index. But, you know, we'll leave it to them. So simple is smart. And ETFs are quite simple. But they give you that sort of performance that makes them worthwhile. They all know there's some, some things that happen, you know. You can go and spend a fortune and go to a really expensive restaurant always, but a little Italian place around the corner gives you just as good a meal at about a quarter of the price. So we always look for simplicity. It's always nice to have a nice meal somewhere if somebody else is paying. Um, but simple is often smart, and that's what ETFs give you. All right, so I'm going to leave it at that. So what we're talking about ETFs, they're index trackers. They now give you increasing exposure to all different asset classes, both in South Africa and globally. Uh, they... Uh, they help with all sorts of things as in terms of managing risk and diversification and volatility and so on. We'll talk a bit more about that. And they tend to outperform active managers, including in South Africa. We think our market's quite small. Those active guys would probably be able to do better, but they struggle, perhaps because our market's small. So that's what we've done up until now. What I now want to talk about a bit is, uh, is, um, is constructing portfolios. Now, portfolios were... You say, well, if I've got an ETF like the Satrix 40, my exposure is purely to South Africa because I'm buying the top 40 South African shares. Is that where I want to be? Well, I, yeah, maybe I want to be in South Africa, but what happens if the politics and economics and all the rest stay in the, you know, where they are at the moment? And then perhaps I want to be offshore. I don't want to be invested in South Africa. I want to have exposure globally. I want to have exposure to assets where the exchange rate depreciates, those assets will go up automatically, so I want to have branded exposure. Or I don't want to be in equities, I want to be in bonds, or I want to be in commodities or some sort of alternative asset class. So that's what's called constructing a portfolio, because a portfolio is there to give you that broad exposure across various asset classes and across various types of strategies. Now, typically, when you're looking at constructing a portfolio, and some of this is quite simple, You've probably all been to university. I mean, there's a couple of universities down here in Cape Town, and there's a good one in Stellenbosch if you, if you can travel down the road a bit. Um, the, uh, anything you've learned about investment, they say, well, the critical issue is having a strategic asset allocation strategy. And a strategic asset allocation strategy really just says you want to be diversified across different types of asset classes. So you want to be in bonds, property, cash, South African equities, foreign equities. That's a very simple strategic asset allocation strategy. So I don't have all my eggs in one basket. I'm diversifying. And, uh, and that's really your only, in the long term, the only real free meal you get in investment is by being diversified over time. Because there's been periods when global markets perform, in periods when the South African market performs, in periods when bonds do well, in periods when bonds don't do so well, and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, or you just want to be in something that's very low risk, like cash. Now, that's a, that's a classic strategic asset allocation strategy. Now, most of the research that's been done, and we had guys getting Nobel Prizes for this, so that 90% of all your performance in an investment portfolio over time comes from just being in the right strategic asset allocation. It's not from picking the right share. Should I buy Discovery or should I buy MMI or Sunlum? It's being in the right strategic asset allocation. Now, you can move that asset allocation around. You can say, I want to hold more cash in certain times and less cash in other times and more equities in certain times and less equities in other times. But that sort of strategy is at the heart of your long-term portfolio approach if you're a long-term investor. And most of us are long-term investors because we were in markets for three to five years, and that's long-term. And that's all that the industry does. When they sit and have their committee meetings at some time, the first thing they look at is what is our asset allocation strategy? 
does it need to change? Are we sticking to that strategy? Are we diverting from that strategy and why? And so your simple approach is getting your strategic allocation, SAS right. Now, if you say, I want to invest just in that strategic allocation strategy, you can do it through indices. So what we've got here is we're saying 10% in cash. Well, you've got an index in South Africa called the Steffi Index, which just measures the returns of money market funds. This is three months money issued by banks. And that Steffi Index measures cash. The oral bond index measures the return of bonds, interest, coupons, plus capital gains or losses in bonds. The JSC All Share Index measures the return of South African equities. The offshore equity performance is measured by the Morgan Stanley World Index and RANDS, that's MSWR, and South African Listed Property Index, well, that's the SAPY, lists the measures the performance of South African listed property. And this is our strategic asset allocation strategy, and it might be different. We might say we want to have more or less in equities or whatever have you. Now, if you just took the performance of that index, the Steffi Index, the Orbi, et cetera, et cetera, and you weighted it. So you said, if I've got 10% of my money in cash, then 10% of my performance will come from that cash. So how, does, how much does that contribute to my overall return in the market? So you do what's called weighted average returns. And over three years, five years, and 10 years, and this is going backwards from June this year, that portfolio, if you just bought indices to give you exposure to that strategic asset allocation strategy, would have given you 6.5% return per annum over three years, 7.7% over five years, and 11.5% over 10 years. Is that good or is that bad? Well, it's not as good as it's been in the past. <laughs> but that's what a strategic asset allocation strategy gives you. And that's the benchmark that every manager is measuring his returns and performance against that sort of benchmark, which is his strategic asset allocation strategy. Um, and it seems a bit, you know, six and a half percent. Well, hell, I might have put my money in the bank and done better. But, you know, that's what it is. But how good is that against the industry? So here yeah, we've got this. We're just putting our strategic asset allocation strategy into indices. Now we're saying let's measure how well the total South African medium equity unit trusted. Medium equities, we have about 60% in equities. And our strategic asset allocation strategy was 60% in South African and foreign equities. Or let's give them a bit more of a chance and let's say, let's see how well we've done the high equity unit trust. So the high equity unit trust is where they often hold 75% or so in equities. Now the average returns of all those managers over three years, five years, 10 years has been way below our benchmark just using an index. <laughs> so our entire industry in South Africa is underperforming. And there's, you know, I don't want to write a doctoral thesis about why that's happening, but you know, when we, we're only here till what, up or six, so we don't want to get into that. Uh, but that's, that's what's happening. <clears throat> so you can take a fairly simple index-based strategy in South Africa and do better than the industry. Just to rub it in, I'm not being nasty about anybody, <laughs> but yeah. So let's look at your medium equity funds. And let's say how many of those geniuses actually outperformed this index tracking uh, the, the index portfolio. 6.5% over three years, 7.5%, 7 7.7 over five years, 11.5 out of 10 years. And of these funds, there's 74 unit trusts over three years, 52 over five years, and 36 over 10 years. The number of guys in the industry declines over time because if you're not a successful unit trust, you shut it down. So you have survivorship bias. So, so the survivors stay in business. The ones who don't survive stay out of business. But despite giving them plenty of time to do it, you find that over 10 years, not a single unit trust manager has outperformed that index over three years and over five years. Sorry, five years and 10 years. And two of them did it over three years. So they're spending all that money, looking after portfolios and so on, and they're struggling to beat a fairly simple benchmark. Yes, sir. Are those figures after cost charges? Yeah, that's after what they call TRs, total expense ratio. So that's, that's after cost, yeah. What about the guys who go high equity? Well, that's slightly better over a uh, three-year period. 5% of them outperform the index portfolio over five years, four and a half. And over 10 years, the survivorship bias kicked in and 13% of them outperformed that index. But that's quite a small base. So using index tracking or passive strategies 
but using a strategic asset location to decide which assets I want to be in can give you market beating performance. If you now become more aggressive on this and you maybe change your strategies from time to time, there's times I want to be in South African equities, there's times I want to be more in foreign equities, so I'll maybe change my strategic asset location strategy over time. You can do even better than that. But passive doesn't mean that you're going to underperform. <laughs> using ETFs, using passive investment, doesn't mean that you're going to underperform the industry. In fact, it means you're going to outperform the industry. So why well, pay them a lot of money? <clears throat> but what you'll find going forward, and ETFSA is probably the only people doing it at the moment that are already specialists in running portfolios in South Africa using ETFs. Globally, you're finding more and more the guys on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, the ETF strategists. These are blokes who say, we'll use ETFs, index trackers, to give us exposure to all these different asset classes. And we do it cheaply because ETFs are much cheaper than active managers, and we'll do it where we can, be, we can get in and out immediately, because these things trade on stock markets, so they have the transparency and the liquidity. So let's not rub this in anymore, but that, that's the circumstances. So a simple passive index tracking uh, multi-asset portfolio outperforms the great majority of actively managed unit trusts. Why? Well, let, let's go through this quickly. The unit trust cost structures are very high, particularly in multi-managed portfolios, because often they... They go and buy a whole portfolio of shares, and they're trading those shares all the time, and there's costs as you trade those shares. Or they say, let's go and buy a unit trust. So I won't, I'm a unit trust manager, and I'll go buy other people's unit trusts. That's what's called fund of funds. So I'm paying the costs of the, this guy's unit trust, and I'm putting it into my own wrapper, and I'm also charging my fees. So those fee structures are very high, particularly in the multi-manager space. If you're going to go and buy a unit trust, just go and buy a unit trust that gives you a small cap exposure or gives you a property exposure or gives you equity exposure. Don't go by multi-manager unit trust. Now, 90% of the new money in South Africa goes into multi-manager unit trusts. So it shows that nobody listens to, you know, to reason, but that's, that's, so the cost structures are high. Maybe the guys are just selecting shares badly, but let's leave that one. Um, efficient markets, the more efficient your market is, the more that everything's priced into the, into a share. If all your knowledge about a, a single stock has to be published, you have to put out a sense announcement if there's anything that can affect the price of a share. So the market has infinite knowledge. It knows what's going on most of the time. It's become a professional market. When I started, I'm probably even Simon, it was quite easy because the stockbrokers, we were competing against dentists and doctors. These guys didn't know anything about investments. But we were brokers. We knew what we were doing. So we would do quite well. Now everybody's a professional. <laughs> These guys have all gone to Harvard and the MBAs and this and that and all the rest and so forth. So the, the more professional a market becomes, gets, the more efficient it becomes. And if it becomes efficient, then the price of all the knowledge in the market is always in the price of the share. So when you're buying an index, you're buying those shares at the current price of the market. So therefore, it becomes very difficult to outperform the average return of an index. That's why you get this... 93% of active managers can't outperform an index because of efficient markets. And uh, yeah, and there's, there's low volatility in index trackers. Volatility is really your, your uh, fluctuations and prices. And you, you measure volatility against the standard deviation against an index. When you're buying an index, you're actually buying beta. <laughs> so you're not buying any standard deviation. So therefore, your ETF strategies are much lower, less volatile. Volatility is quite important. If something goes from 100 and it drops to 60, it takes a lot longer to get back to 100 than if something goes to 100 and it drops to 80, it gets back to 100 quicker. So the less volatility you've got, the better. And that's why you have a portfolio of shares because you say, well, I might have some volatility in one sector of the market, but I've got less volatility in the other. And your different sectors of the market reduce your overall volatility. And if you've got the right sort of software, which professional managers do, you measure your standard deviation across portfolios, your concentration levels, all those sort of issues. But low volatility of index trackers makes it very hard to beat a properly managed index tracking portfolio. <clears throat> All right, so we, we've emphasized that one as well, and we, we're doing quite well for time. But I run out of steam after a while. I'm an old bloke, so we better move on. Okay. Um, the next slide is to say, well, I've just shown you indices. I haven't said, can you do this in ETS? But you can. If you want to put 10% in cash, well, you can buy the ABSA Tracy Money market fund, that's, that's a money market fund that's structured as an ETF. If you want to buy bonds, you can go and buy the new funds Govi, which is a government bond index in South Africa. You can buy the top shares, 
take Satrix Top 40. I'm not recommending these. I'm just using these examples. You want to buy a world fund, buy the Satrix, Signia Etrix, MSCI world fund, and you can buy a property fund. You allocated the same as you did in that, that other portfolio, 10% cash, 20% bonds, 30% equities, SA equities, 30% offshore. Those are your performances of each of those ETFs. And here's your average rated return over three and five years. Most of those ETFs haven't been around for 10 years, so we can't do 10-year numbers. I've only done three and five. And lo and behold, that actually does our index portfolio go over 6.5%. This one gives us 7 a bit. And our index portfolio over five years is 7,7. This one gives us 8,1%. So in fact, some of these ETFs, because we, we're using a Govi index rather than an Orbi index, we're using a top 40 index of an all share index, and so on, actually give you slightly better performance. <laughs> but you can replicate a simple asset allocation using ETFs. So don't say it can't be done. It can be done quite simply. And we run quite a lot of portfolios. When I say we, it's ETFSA. Just doing that. Just replicating simple asset allocation strategies. And uh, that can be done. So uh, you don't have to go and buy <coughs> an actively managed portfolio to give you this sort of exposure, a strategic asset allocation strategy. All right. So now let's get on to stuff. And this is close to Simon's heart. He's, he's a great man for tax-free accounts. Um, I just want to say one or two things about tax-free accounts. I think ETFs are the best product to use in tax-free accounts. And there's now 70 ETFs that you can use in a tax-free account. You can't use commodities and you can't use ETNs, exchange-traded notes, because they're not recognized under CISCA, the Collect Investment Scheme Act, as, as, uh, as collective investment schemes registered under the Act. They don't recognize commodities as an asset class, for instance, despite the fact that we've had gold mined in South Africa in 20 years. The geniuses in Pretoria don't realize that you can actually buy gold as an investment. But, you know, that's, be that as it may. The, uh, so, but even so, you've still got over 70 Cisco registered ETFs. And they give you access to all these different asset classes, local and global equities, local and global bonds, local and global listed property, high-yielding dividend funds, etc. Uh, they're more efficient than unit trusts in uh, tax-free accounts. The one is lower cost. But this one here is very important. When you, when, you, when you buy a tax-free investment and you're getting paid four dividends a year, which an ETF does, or unit trust pays you four dividends a year, you go and look at your unit trust portfolio and see how big the dividends are. The dividends are negligible because their costs eat up those dividends. But if I get a tax-free investment, my dividends, I can now reinvest the dividends 100% without having to pay tax. But if the unit trust managers already absorb the dividends, I don't get any dividends out of them. So what's really efficient in the ETFs is you get this big dividend flow. Now, I often get guys, even one or two in the audience, saying, I like my ETF portfolio because I get this cash flow. Every quarter, there's all this money comes through. <laughs> but my unit trust portfolios don't do that. That's because the expenses are too high. <laughs> so you must be in low-cost products if you want to get the benefit of reinvesting 100% of your dividends or 100% of your interest. And that's a big advantage in tax-free investments is because uh, any theory, and you know, as you say, you all went to university, even up down the mountain, Cape Town, they told you how important it is reinvesting income. Over long periods of time, reinvesting dividends is a big portion of your performance in a long-term portfolio. But now you can invest 100% of your dividends because otherwise, in a normal portfolio, they've already taken off 20% withholding tax. And even if they've reinvested your interest, you deem to have earned that interest, so you get a tax certificate at the end of the year, and you've got to pay the interest in your tax, tax bill. And interest is taxed at your marginal rate once you've used up your 23,000 tax-free interest. So buying low-cost products like ETFs in tax fees makes a, makes, a big, makes a big difference. Also, don't waste your money in buying a savings account through tax-free, because you get the first 23,000 rand interest is tax-free anyway. <laughs> You know, and if you're investing 33,000 Rand a year in a tax-free account, you're only going to earn about 2,000 Rands with interest. So put your tax-free accounts into shares or into unit trusts. We can't buy shares, unit trusts or ETFs where you're going to see capital growth. You want high dividend yields and you want capital growth because both capital growth and dividends are not taxed in a tax-free account. When I sell that tax-free account, I don't get taxed. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of tips. I said I wasn't going to give you some tips. I'll give you one or two tips for nothing. <clears throat> That's probably what they're worth. Um, some providers, uh, ETFSA does it. I think Easy Equities does it. 
offer model portfolios and tax-free, that's often not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, we offer four different model portfolios, and some guys and girls go and put, um, yeah, they spread their tax-free investment across all four portfolios. So I'm putting 33,000 Rand in, but I'm buying four different portfolios with about four ETFs in each. So I'm buying 16 ETFs spread across different areas of the market in portfolios. And so those model portfolios and tax-free savings are worth looking at. Um, and as I say, we, we, we do them, but so, some other people do it as well. But one or two things to look at, and it's a pity that tax-free um, investments are so small, only 33,000 Rand a year. But now that it's been going for five years, we've got quite a few investors that got 160,000 Rand in tax free because they put 33,000 Rand or 30,000 Rand away every year. Now, 160,000 Rand now means you've got a reasonable size portfolio. And there's you and your granny and your kids, and they've all got 160,000 Rand. So now it becomes quite a big issue. Listed property is a very good asset to have in a tax free. Why? Because it pays you at the moment about a 9% dividend yield. But when they pay you that dividend, a listed property company pays you what's called a taxable dividend. So most of that dividend is taxed as income. It's not taxed as a dividend. Because all they're doing is they're passing through a property company, their, their REIT, their real estate investment trust, they're just passing income through to you. So you're the landlord. <laughs> landlord receives money, takes away his cut, he passes all the rest through to you. That's what a real estate investment trust does. So you tax at income tax rates. But if you receive your dividend through a tax free account, you get 100% of that dividend. It doesn't get taken out in tax. So holding property shares is not a bad idea in a tax free account. The other one is foreign markets. If you hold foreign investments, what sort of dividends do you get? Nothing. Because <laughs> they tax those things offshore and they come here and you get a foreign dividend in South Africa. By the time you looked at the, those dividend yield from international investments are very low. But if you're in a tax-free account, you'll get that dividend, the full dividend. So again, it helps. If you're looking at foreign investments, at the moment, foreign bonds are not very attractive because they're paying you 1% you know, interest rate. In fact, in Germany and Europe, they're now issuing 10-year bonds at negative interest rates. So you're paying them to hold your money, and they're going to give you no interest for 10 years, which doesn't make sense. It says there's going to be deflation. So I'd rather hold cash than buy an asset. If you're going to do that, you know, that's to me, that's a serious problem. There's some serious distortions happening in global markets. But foreign markets, dividends that come through a tax-free account are, are attractive. And as I said, your big thing in your tax-free accounts is your capital gain. You build up your 33,000 Rand a year for 20 years, by the time you finish, it's worth three or four million rand, and that money you can access without ever paying any tax. Whereas if you've got a living annuity or something paying your pension, you pay income tax in your pension. But yeah, this pool of money you built up is never going to be taxed again. So that's the big advantage there. Now, retirement funds, I just want to cover one of the things that I think is quite important that doesn't seem to be talked about, certainly in the press. Maybe it's been talked about by asset managers and so on. But from March 2019, so just down, just a couple of days ago, all pension and provident funds now have to offer their members what's called a default option. And a default option is where they, they offer you a retirement uh, uh, product that is designed for people who don't know which retirement product to pick, but is really the sort of option for people who want a low-cost, simple retirement product that is going to meet certain parameters. At the moment... Retirement annuity funds and preservation funds don't have to offer default portfolios, but they do have to offer default living annuity. So if you leave your retirement fund and you take a pension, uh, a living annuity, they have to offer a default option. So most retirement annuity funds, including ours, are said, we're going to offer a default option. We might as well offer it in our retirement funds as well as our living annuity. So pre-retirement as well as post-retirement. So those default options are quite important. And what a default investment portfolio must be, and there's a whole section in the Act that came out, They've got to be fully transparent in the investment holdings. So you can't hide anymore what's in your portfolio. You've got to say exactly what's in it. So a lot of managers hate these things. <laughs> you go and tell Mokta she's got to not tell everybody who, those structured products and hedge funds she owns and all that. She hates the idea. That skeleton fund of hers, there's lots of skeletons of that. But, you know, she's not going to disclose those. So I'm not saying she's not a bad performer, but she's got to disclose. That's what the act says. It's got to be reasonably priced and competitive. They hate that as well. It's got to be competitive, reasonably priced. You've got to dis disclose all your fees and charges. Not just what the portfolio costs, but what the package wrapping costs and what the administration costs and what the benefits administration costs. And all. It's got to be fully disclosed. When the legislation first came out, and this has been floating around for the last year or two, 
the government said that you should actually put all your money into ETFs and passive investment. But it's now been watered down by the industry with all the lobby groups, the CSIN and all the rest are saying now both passive and active can be considered. But the original act said just go and buy a passive. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the original FSCA stuff. But we were, everybody was asked to comment on it and everybody commented on it. So we now got more. And you can't have complex products. You can't have loyalty bonuses. You can't have wrappers. You can't have all these things that the insurance companies are trying to sell you. So those default options are quite a simple strategy to follow in retirement. Now, remember I said earlier, I said simple is smart. So maybe default options are not a bad idea. So let's look at a, a default, and I'm doing a bit of advertising here for ETFSA, but I'm sure other people can do that as well. We offer what we call a wealth default portfolio in our retirement annuities and our living annuities. And here we just run a strategic asset allocation. This one we say we'll have 33% in SA equity, 27% in international equity, and that's because you're only allowed to put 30% into foreign shares in a, in a retirement annuity fund under Regulation 28. And if the foreign markets run, your 27% becomes 30%, you would very, very quickly. So you don't want to be forced to sell, so you always have a tolerance limit. So we have 27% international. We have a bit in listed property because of the high yields. And interest bearing South Africa, we have you know, reasonable exposure there. And this is the portfolio we run, cash, new funds, Govi, core shares, top 50, which is probably your best uh, SA portfolio, prop tax 10, which is top 10 property shares. And we buy the Satrix MECI World Index. Um, so that's a strategic asset allocation strategy we use in a, in a default portfolio. Um, how does it do? Well, you know, we, we have to go back and run those indices historically because we only introduced it this year. But over six months, gave you 7% a year, 6%, three years, 7,1, 8,2, five years. So the performance isn't bad. And it's what you, it looks pretty much like those index portfolios I showed you earlier. Same sort of returns as those index portfolios. But 8,2% over five years means you'd be in the top quartile, perhaps in the top 10, performance-wise, of all retirement annuity funds in South Africa. So those sort of strategies, and there's one crowd at the moment, I think they're 10x, but we won't mention any names, saying that over the last 10 years, they've had a 12% return in their RA fund. We could have just bought a strategic asset allocation fund and gave you 12%. Because 10 years is a, you know, what they call it, a, you know, it's the right place to be. <laughs> you know, it's a, one of these nice spots, because over 10 years, you've had quite nice performance. But a fairly simple portfolio can give you very good returns. And I think what we'll see going forward, and, and you, know, you can do this when you get to your company, so what default option are you offering in your retirement fund? You know, I work for the government or something like that. What's your default option? Well, we don't really have one. Why don't you go for a nice, simple ETF, passive portfolio, whatever have you? And uh, if they do that and they do it in volume and they come to us or they go to even mocked or something like that, you'll give them a discount, you know, because it's big enough money, you know, they won't have to pay. So the fees will be low and that sort of stuff. So defaults, I think, will become quite a big thing in the retirement industry. Right, let's move on. I think I've got one or two other things to say. Now, managed ETF portfolios, this is where I'm talking to you about things like asset allocation strategies and moving between sectors and buying different ETFs and stuff like that. If you can't do it yourself, well, we manage those sort of portfolios. Um, and that's the biggest part of our business these days. Um, and uh, so we are ETF strategists and there are other people doing it. But managing portfolios using ETFs makes some sense, as I think I've sort of told you um, as we go through this. So let's just look at a portfolio. Now we're saying let's use a slightly different strategic asset gain strategy. We're going to put 40% into foreign equities. 10% in the S into listed property, but we're going to buy a global property fund, not a saving property fund. We're going to put 20% in the commodities, okay? And we put 30% in SA equities. So that's our strategic asset allocation strategy. So that's quite a bit different from the ones we were looking at before. And these are the returns, return per annum over the last five years, the average returns. And here's your weighted average return, which now goes from the 8% of a simple strategic asset allocation strategy to almost double that, 15.47%. That's actual. And we've got some portfolios doing that, you know, and some of them are doing better than that. So, so you can actually go out there and manage these portfolios using the ETFs to give you that sort of, uh, those, those sort of returns. Um, and that's what I think you'll see more and more of. And the young generation, when you look at, not guys like Simon and myself, the young guys, they also want to get into ETFs because that's what it's all about in the future. How do I learn about ETFs? How do I manage ETFs and all that sort of stuff? They're all going to be doing this one of these days. 
but well, then I'll be retired, hopefully, but uh, uh, speaking from the grave or whatever have you. Um, the, uh, or you can do it internationally. Now you've got 6,000 ETFs to choose from. So here, yeah, this is quite a busy slide. But this is, a, this is the st strategy we're using about six months ago. I'll tell you what the current strategies are. But here you had 40% in developed markets, 30% in emerging markets. So your South African equity now becomes emerging market equity. So you're looking at China, India. This, this is an Asia fund, basically. 15% uh, in bonds, but we basically, we're not buying U.S. Treasuries. We're buying a global infrastructure fund an emerging market bond fund, which give you much higher returns. Uh, and then property was quite good yields and high yield property ETFs. And we've got a little bit of money sitting in gold, which has been tremendous because the last six months, gold has been going like hell in dollars. So it was a good good pick. And that gives you about 9.5% in US dollars, which in rands, this is over the last five years, gives you about 21%. So offshore portfolios, if you manage them, give you very good rand returns. But once you take money offshore, because we only run this for people who've got money sitting in offshore bank accounts, uh, and there's a lot of that these days, <laughs> um, is a, uh, you're looking at about a 9%, 10% return in dollars is good. We won't mention names, but if Sunlomon and Investec and Alan Gray can give you more than 6 or 7% per annum in dollars, that's high. <laughs> but you can do it in ETFs. You can do those sort of returns and perhaps a little bit better. So you can manage money locally and internationally or a mix of both using ETFs. And that's really what the, um, the new generation is going to be doing. More and more, you're going to be saying, how do I use passive index trackers, ETFs, or maybe index trackers and unit trusts, putting them together, having the advantages of low betas, et cetera, et cetera, and low standard deviations, and constructing portfolios out of that, and using that as one of my asset strategies. So I can still go and give money to you know, those nice blokes. They'll probably buy you lunch if you go and see them at the v and waterfront. But you don't have to give all your money to the active managers because they all have the same mandate. They just have different addresses in Cape Town. They're all, they're all doing the same thing. They're just located differently. Using passive as part of your building blocks probably makes sense. Okay, and then depending on your risk, going from very low risk, just using indices to using ETFs to give you exposure to indices to using a default retirement portfolio, to using a managed portfolio where you're now using all the ETFs available without the constrictions of a Reg 28, or taking it offshore, and this is the RAND returns, you can have very different sort of returns. These are five-year returns, actual returns over a, over a period of time, but you're going through different risk parameters and different risk profiles. So let me leave it at that. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, and that's who you get a hold of if you want to. Um, the, uh, are there any questions? <clears throat>